Welcome to this webinar of the USB Alumni Association and to all our guests, our corporate guests, our students, um, alumni. Welcome to this um, webinar presented today by Dr. Ashinaki Fanta on the implications of COVID-19 on infrastructure finance in Africa. We will start within a minute or two. We are just waiting for some people still to join us from the room, just to give them time to find their links. Um, this webinar will be followed immediately thereafter by a USB program information session um, presented by the USB um, Professor Andre Rue, and that will take us through to two o'clock so everybody joining in the alumni webinar now of Dr. Fanta is welcome to stay on right through to two o'clock if your time allows. Welcome again to everybody who's just entered. Um, I will in a minute hand over to our facilitator for um, me, Shoyo Imologami. In the meantime, may I please ask you to mute your microphones you can, of course, use your video if you're comfortable with that. Uh, we love to see the faces on the screen. Um, but otherwise, you can switch off your video. Your microphone must be on mute, please. And then I would like to encourage you to, throughout the morning, raise your questions in the chat box. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will find the chat box. You can post your questions there. And other than this, Please just enjoy this session this morning. Welcome to everybody who has just joined us on this alumni webinar of Dr. Ashinavi Fanta um, on the implications of COVID-19 on infrastructure finance in Africa. Um, I see some familiar faces joining us there. Welcome to all of you. And we're looking forward to your participation in the chat box. There will be an opportunity at the end to engage with Dr. Fanta. Well, with this then, I would like to um, introduce to you this morning our very special chairperson of the West Africa chapter of the Alumni Association, Shayo Imologomi. Shayo is currently the CEO and lead consultant at Strat Novati Consulting an indigenous firm birth to assist businesses in providing strategic direction and substance to their visions and aspirations. Stratnavazi's vision is to be a global force in providing creatively innovative and positively disruptive business solutions to its esteemed clientele that help reposition their businesses for continuous and consistent future growth. Shayo has almost 30 years of experience in finance, auditing and compliance, consultancy and advisory, and more recently business development and strategy. Her career has taken her through almost every industry and in Nigeria. She is well known um, in Nigeria. She's been nominated for several awards um, and we are very, very proud to have her as a USB MBA alumnus to facilitate this session this morning. Shaya previously served as the Group Compliance Director of Troika Holdings Limited, the biggest indigenous conglomerate in the advertising space in Nigeria. This group has business interest in marketing communications, public relations, media buying, out of home advertising, digital marketing solutions, property development, and security and protection. Shayo, that's a mouthful. We're very, very happy to have you with us this morning. I hand over with all the trust to you to facilitate this question with Dr. Fanta. Thank you. Thank you much, Christelle. And welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm so glad that you could join us. Please, wherever you are joining from, just drop a note in the chat box to say I'm from Ghana, I'm from Botswana, I'm from Nigeria. Wherever you're joining us from, just drop a note in the chat box there. Um, once again, I'd like to say a warm, warm welcome to you. This is a two-hour session, and we're going to start the session with um, a, a presentation from our guest speaker. And we have a very seasoned gentleman in the house, 
who is going to take us through the topic for today. And immediately after that, there's going to be a very interesting in-depth information session by my former professor, Professor Andre Ru. He taught me at cons when I did my MBA. So it's actually a pleasure meeting him again today, even though I haven't had the time to actually have um, a chat with him. But he's going to handle the information session. So whatever you're, you want to know more about the USB, the programs that they offer, that is the session that you can, you know, answer all, you'd have all the answers to those questions there. So very quickly, um, I'd like to say also that there are two other sessions next week on the 20th. We're going to have another USB session, which is going to be hosted by Ghana. So if you can't stay for the, unit, for the entire session today, don't worry, you can quickly register for the Ghana session. And I'm sure Christelle will post the link at the appropriate time. And the following week, 3rd September, we're going to have another session hosted by Botswana. So we have three weeks back to back of wonderful speakers presenting interesting topics and quality information sessions after that. So very quickly, the session, how we're going to run today, we are going to receive the presentation by our guest speaker, who is going to be talking about the implications of COVID-19 on the infrastructure finance in Africa. And we have a very, very competent person to handle that, Dr. Ashnafi Fanta, and I will introduce him at the appropriate time. Now, during the session, if you have questions, please put the questions in the chat box. And at the end of the session, the professor will address all your questions. Yes, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, we have people from Cape Town. You're very, very welcome. Nigeria, you are welcome. Um, yes, yeah, South Africa, everyone, you are so, so welcome. So um, after that, we will have our question and answer after the presentation. Now, during the presentation, there's going to be a short poll. I want to appeal to all of us to participate in that poll. Now, let me introduce Dr. Ashnafi. Dr. Ashnafi Fanta is a senior lecturer of the development finance at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. Prior to joining Stellenbosch University, Dr. Fanta worked as a data analysis and segmentation expert at Finmark Trust, where he was involved in, de in developing segmentation models to, and wrote policy research papers on topics including financial inclusion of women financial literacy, mobile money, over-indebtedness, and SME financing. Dr. Fanta has published widely in a number of scholarly journals and delivered papers at international conferences. Recently, he, re he received the Best Paper Award from Taylor and Francis at the International Academy of African Business and Development Conference held in Atlanta for his paper published in the Journal of African Business. His research interests include financial development, SME finance, financial inclusion and corporate governance of financial institutions. Dr. Fanta holds a doctoral degree in social and economic sciences, corporate finance from Johannes, from Johannes Kepler University of Linz in Austria, and a master's degree in accounting and finance from Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Dr. Fanta is multilingual and fluent in English, Amharic, and Walatinga. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce and bring Dr. Ashnafi Fanta for his presentation. Dr. Fanta. Thank you, Shayo, for your uh, very generous introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely excited to talk to you on the topic of infrastructure finance uh, in the post-COVID uh, era in Africa. Uh, I am a lecturer of uh, the module now for uh, four years, uh, and uh, I've been closely following the uh, development uh, in the sector. And the recent uh, events uh, following the uh, pandemic uh, have been a concern to everyone, but after closely looking at uh, the infrastructural uh, financing and how COVID might affect 
uh, infrastructure funding in Africa, I wanted to uh, talk to you on uh, this topic. The key messages of my uh, talk uh, are uh, three. The first one is uh, that infrastructure is vital for economic transfer, uh, transformation and uh, post-COVID economic uh, recovery. And the second message is uh, Africa has large infrastructure financing gap and this gap is likely to widen due to uh, the pandemic. And the third message uh, is that uh, we need to explore alternative financing schemes uh, in order to narrow the financing uh, gap because uh, the traditional financing uh, schemes may not be available or they may not be, uh, I mean, they may prove to be uh, unavailable due to what is happening in uh, the financial uh, market uh, at the moment. So let me explain, let me exp expand on each. Uh, when you look at uh, infrastructure, infrastructure provides useful uh, economic uh, benefits uh, that has been confirmed through uh, theoretical and empirical uh, work by many scholars. I don't want to indulge you into uh, the theories uh, that explain the linkages between uh, infrastructure development and economic growth, but I just want to emphasize on the fact that we need uh, infrastructural development uh, in order to achieve uh, economic transformation in Africa. Uh, many African countries are now looking at transforming their economies in order to uh, reduce poverty, in order to create uh, jobs. Uh, we have uh, in Africa, uh, I mean, uh, a, a large amount of uh, the population uh, without uh, jobs and uh, due to, uh, I mean, uh, due to uh, the pandemic, uh, job losses have continued to uh, increase. So economic transformation is uh, very critical. Economic transformation includes the structural transformation where uh, productive labor can be uh, shifted from less productive sectors to uh, more productive uh, sectors. If you look at the three major economic sectors, uh, we have the agricultural sector, the service sector, and the industry. Uh, when countries grow, the usual path would be a shift from agricultural sector to the service and industrial uh, sector. So uh, structural transformation is very critical and infrastructure provides critical uh, input into uh, structural transformation. If we want to grow the industrial uh, sector or to industrialize Africa, def definitely we need to invest in energy, we need to invest in uh, uh, the transport infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, and other critical uh, infrastructural uh, sectors. Uh, economic transformation also entails increasing labor uh, productivity in all the three sectors. And achieving labor productivity uh, can be done through uh, infrastructural uh, development. So infrastructural development is critical for uh, economic transformation in Africa, uh, not only for economic transformation, but uh, it is also critical for economic recovery. Uh, as you know, uh, the pandemic led to uh, significant job losses and uh, many countries across the world are experiencing uh, contraction of uh, output. And uh, this has to be uh, I mean, uh, reversed uh, through increased uh, business activity. And this can happen through uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, when you look at uh, the consequences of uh, the pandemic, at a global uh, level, 
uh, output has uh, contracted. I have uh, figures from the World Bank, uh, which shows a uh, contraction of uh, output across different regions in the world. As you can see, uh, there are areas where a big contraction uh, in output uh, uh, is expected in 2020. Uh, when you look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we seem to have about a 2.8% contraction in uh, output. And this is significant in light of the fact that uh, many African countries have been recording uh, a very fast uh, economic uh, growth. So for African countries experiencing contraction of this uh, amount, is uh, a big loss and there had been uh, positive uh, developments in uh, poverty reduction across the globe but uh, with contraction of output uh, uh, it's going to uh, reverse uh, the global contraction as i said earlier uh, is 5.2 percent and the contraction is uh, expected to be high in high income countries uh, with about uh, 7%. And in emerging and developing countries, uh, on average, as the contraction is 2.5. Uh, the health and economic consequences of the pandemic are likely to be uh, worse in countries with widespread uh, informality. And this is a big concern for us in Africa because uh, we have large uh, segment of the economy in the informal uh, sector. And the blow is the hardest uh, in countries that rely in global trade, uh, tourism, commodity export, and external financing. As you know, Many African countries rely on uh, commodity export. Uh, we rely on agricultural uh, commodity export and other uh, export items. So this is going to be a, a challenge for uh, many African countries. Uh, so investment in inf infrastructure can help in job creation and in boosting uh, private sector uh, activities. Uh, but when you look at uh, the state of infrastructure in Africa, uh, the picture is uh, a bit gloomy. Uh, both availability of infrastructural services and access of uh, the population to infrastructure services in Africa is uh, very low. I want to present uh, the access as well as availability by uh, each uh, individual sector of uh, infrastructure. When you look at the energy infrastructure, uh, although this is a, a bit older data, but uh, the, uh, the picture that you, uh, you get from uh, here is uh, a bit shocking. Uh, you find out that uh, combined power generation capacity of 44 uh, Sub-Saharan African countries with a population of 800 million is less than, uh, less than that of Spain with a population of 45 uh, million. And although there had been some changes uh, where uh, African economics are investing in uh, power generation uh, here and there, but uh, the gap has not uh, narrowed uh, significantly. And as a result, uh, millions of Africans are without access to uh, energy. And in Africa, uh, access to e electricity is 40%. And this is uh, the lowest uh, in the world. Uh, in the transport sector, uh, the picture you know, is not uh, significantly uh, different. Uh, only 208 kilometers of uh, roads are available per uh, 1,000 uh, square kilometers of uh, land area. And this compares to the world average of 944 uh, kilometers per 
1,000 uh, square kilometers. And in the water uh, infrastructure sector, uh, back in 2010, only 61% of Africans had access to clean water and uh, only 31% uh, had access to adequate uh, sanitation. And the ICT sector uh, also has been lagging by the way the ICT sector is very critical for uh, economic transformation because uh, as you are aware, we are now uh, moving at a global stage uh, to uh, the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution. And the fourth in, in this industrial revolution uh, is based on uh, well-developed uh, ICT infrastructure. And uh, if we do not invest enough in ICT infrastructure, it will be difficult to embrace the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, so the gap, the infrastructure gap in Africa is uh, huge. Uh, not only the infrastructure gap, uh, the deficit, the financing deficit is also uh, very uh, large. And according to uh, a report by the African Development Bank that, uh, that came out back in 2018, uh, in Africa, we have between 130 to 180 uh, billion USD uh, infrastructural needs. And the financing gap is uh, between 68 to 108 uh, billion USD. Uh, this is massive. And when you look at the, uh, the gap across uh, different sectors, you find out that uh, some of the sectors have uh, a, a, a bigger or a wider gap, wh whereas uh, the others have a relatively narrow gap. If you look at the transport sector, the transport sector has about uh, 16 billion uh, USD uh, financing gap. And you have uh, the water sector, on the other hand, 53 billion uh, financing gap. So the finance financing gap is uh, very wide in the uh, water sector compared to transport and uh, energy. The ICT sector doesn't show a significant gap uh, due to the fact that uh, the ICT sector uh, is uh, in, in the hands of uh, uh, private uh, actors. In many countries across Africa, uh, private sector entities participate in the provision of uh, ICT uh, infrastructure. So the financing gap is uh, huge. Uh, and the next question is, who finances infrastructure in Africa? Uh, I tried to look at data from uh, Infrastructure Consortium for uh, Africa. Infrastructure Consortium for Africa is an institution uh, with uh, funding from uh, OECD countries that uh, want to uh, promote uh, infrastructural development uh, in the continent. And this is a picture you find. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, at the top, you have uh, funding from uh, African governments. Uh, the government uh, plays uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the principal role in funding infrastructure in the continent. And then you have uh, ICA uh, funding, but ICA funding has uh, gone down uh, in 2018. If you look at the 2018 figures, uh, at the top, uh, uh, national governments uh, provide 37% of funding, followed by 23% uh, of funding by uh, China. As you can see, uh, the Chinese uh, contribution to infrastructure uh, uh, development and financing is uh, significant. And you have uh, participation of private sector entities, about 22%. But this figure is uh, a bit uh, 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 tricky because uh, you may think uh, that private sector 
has a significant participation in financing infrastructure in the continent, but uh, the figure is influenced by uh, what is happening in South Africa. In South Africa, we have uh, independent power producers uh, working with uh, the government in the provision of uh, electricity. So a significant portion of this figure is uh, due to uh, South Africa. In the rest of Africa, uh, private sector participation in infrastructure uh, provision and financing is uh, minimal, it's very small. Then you have uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, institutions providing uh, funding to infrastructure in uh, Africa. When you look at uh, sectoral breakdown, most of the funding uh, goes to as you can see here, it goes to the transport sector, followed by the energy. By the way, uh, the two sectors are the highly uh, favored uh, sectors uh, due to the fact that uh, there is a huge demand for uh, energy and private sector entities can uh, easily uh, recover their investment uh, in infrastructural uh, services in this area. Uh, whereas if you look at uh, uh, the water sector, uh, it receives relatively a smaller amount of uh, funding. Uh, when you look at uh, the impact of uh, COVID on uh, public finance, I wanted just to look at the uh, impact of COVID on public finance because as I have uh, indicated in, uh, the, uh, in this slide, the public sector is uh, uh, the primary uh, financier of uh, infrastructural uh, services in Africa. So uh, when you look at uh, public finances, there is increased pressure on uh, public finances due to uh, COVID uh, responses, uh, governments uh, must uh, uh, must incur a significant amount of uh, costs in responding to uh, the pandemic. They also had to uh, make uh, welfare payments to uh, vulnerable households, social payments, and various other uh, transfer payments. And the, the other effect on public finance is from loss of revenue. Governments have to uh, provide uh, tax concessions. Uh, they must also uh, provide some help to uh, businesses that are struggling to stand on their uh, own feet. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, to prevent bankruptcy, governments had to bail out uh, private sector entities. So in, in all in all, when you look at it, uh, COVID had uh, impact both on the revenue side and on the expenditure side of uh, the government. And what it means is that money that government can put forward for uh, investment in infrastructure will and no longer be uh, available. And the question, the alternative might be uh, borrowing. Why not we go for uh, borrowing? Why don't we just borrow and invest in uh, infrastructural uh, projects? The problem with borrowing is uh, governments have already reached uh, their uh, borrowing limits. There had been a concern by international uh, financial institutions, uh, including IMF and World Bank, that uh, many African governments are uh, facing a debt crisis. And as you can see uh, in this uh, graph, uh, public debt has been uh, falling since 2001, but uh, it has shown uh, a slight uh, recovery. It has shown uh, a slight increase from uh, 2015 onwards. 
the latest figure is for 2019, but as a result of uh, COVID-19, many governments uh, had to uh, borrow a massive amount of uh, resources from uh, international as well as uh, local uh, markets. And uh, this has pushed uh, public debt uh, beyond uh, what uh, governments uh, can, uh, I mean, handle. Uh, in, uh, in Europe and uh, in the OECD uh, member countries, some uh, governments have uh, public debts uh, by far greater than 100% of uh, GDP, and this is no longer uh, sustainable. And in Africa, already the IMF has identified that about 17 countries in the continent are in high uh, uh, debt risk. Uh, and this is a concern because uh, any further uh, accumulation of debt will be uh, detrimental to uh, the countries. So what alternative uh, means of funding is uh, available? Uh, we can uh, think of infrastructural bonds. In fact, this is uh, a debt, but uh, they will be linked to uh, projects. Uh, they will not add to uh, public debt. Uh, they will be linked to specific infrastructural uh, uh, projects. Uh, infrastructural bonds are uh, designed to attract funding uh, specific uh, to uh, a particular infrastructure. It can be uh, investment in uh, the energy sector or it can be investment in the transportation or uh, some other sector. So without uh, placing further pressure on uh, public finances, infrastructural bonds can be uh, floated and money can be uh, attracted. Uh, recently, in response to uh, the pandemic, uh, countries in West Africa uh, floated uh, a social bond and raised about two billion uh, US dollar in a space of a few months. And I think uh, similar uh, practices can be uh, used by other uh, African countries, but in this case, uh, to fund uh, construction of uh, infrastructural uh, facilities. Uh, the other alternative uh, means of funding would be uh, development impact of bonds. This is one of the innovative uh, financing mechanism introduced. Uh, development impa impact bonds are uh, bonds where uh, private sector entities contribute funding to kickstart an infrastructural uh, uh, activity or infrastructural uh, investment. And they will agree to uh, generate return only if uh, a, a particular development goal is met. If a development goal is not achieved, then the private sector entities will lose. If uh, a development uh, goal is met, then uh, donors will pay out uh, the private sector entities uh, the principal plus uh, return or pr principal plus uh, interest. The, al the other alternative funding uh, is commodity backed uh, loans. Commodity backed loans uh, can be used because uh, African countries uh, have. Uh, I mean, uh, there are uh, resources that uh, countries can uh, exploit uh, and uh, private sector entities can be invited into uh, infrastructural uh, investment uh, programs uh, with uh, expectations that in the event the infrastructural asset fails to generate return, then uh, the commodities can be used in settling uh, the debt. And the other important uh, alternative funding mechanism would be tapping into uh, pension funds. Uh, pension funds constitute uh, important uh, institutional uh, investors 
in uh, many countries across the globe, but in Africa, pension funds are not well developed, except in few countries, including South Africa, in Nigeria, in Kenya, and a few others. Uh, there are initiatives uh, in Nigeria where uh, credit guarantees are made available in order to entice pension funds to invest in infrastructural uh, facilities. As you know, pension funds are uh, very cautious in investing in uh, infrastructure uh, and to provide a guarantee, a local uh, guarantee uh, uh, products can be uh, introduced. And that is exactly what happened in Nigeria. Uh, there was a company by the name uh, InfraCredit uh, providing guarantee to uh, infrastructure related securities. And because uh, guarantee is available to infrastructure related securities, pension funds are now encouraged to invest in uh, infrastructure related uh, securities. I think other African countries can uh, use the example of uh, Nigeria uh, and tap into uh, pension funds to provide uh, funding to uh, infrastructural uh, development in the continent, which will be useful for uh, uh, economic transformation as well as uh, economic recovery. So this is all I have uh, from my side. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashanafi. That was a very, very interesting and engaging session. So I have a couple of questions that um, people have asked and I'll just read them out to you. So the first question is, is there an optimum balance in the type of infrastructure that a country can or should invest in to achieve a notable gain? Uh, that's a very good question, but uh, when you look at uh, the four major infrastructural uh, sectors, namely energy, transport, ICT, and water service, uh, particularly investment in energy is critical and it determines effectiveness of provision of uh, infrastructural services in the other sectors. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, look at uh, the reality in your uh, environment. In some countries, depending on the nature of the economy, a massive investment may, uh, may go to uh, the transport sector due to backlog uh, in that sector. And in other countries, uh, the water sector may need a uh, relatively higher amount of uh, investment. So, it all depends on the nature of economy of a, nature, a nation and how uh, it's structured. For instance, in countries where uh, irrigation is uh, highly uh, needed in order to uh, mean uh, increase agricultural uh, output, then massive investment in irrigation related projects uh, may be needed. But, uh, like I said earlier, energy is the most critical uh, infrastructural uh, sector and uh, countries must uh, continue investing in that sector. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the second question um, we have is, do we have any data on the gap on financing in the health sector? I'm not sure now um, the health sector because and that could be relative because we have different countries represented. But is there any data? Maybe let's look at South Africa, for example. Do we have data on um, the gap on financing in the health sector in South Africa? Uh, I haven't seen data on uh, financing gap in the health sector in uh, South Africa or uh, anywhere in uh, Africa. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, the data from the African uh, Development Bank, uh, they provide data on economic infrastructures. By the way, we classify infrastructure into social and economic. The economic infrastructure constitute uh, energy, ICT, uh, transport and water, whereas uh, social infrastructure constitutes uh, investment in 
health and investment in uh, education. And most uh, institutions that provide uh, information on uh, infrastructure focus on uh, economic infrastructure. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so um, if there are any other persons that have questions, please drop the questions. We have a couple of more minutes to go. Uh, yes, okay, now the questions are coming in. Right, so somebody says the challenge in Africa is not really about funding for infrastructure. The pension funds have trillions of dollars and have appetite for, sorry, I'm for long-term assets. The challenge is mostly around political risk. Governments are reluctant to offer guarantee around political risk. Look at what is happening in Zimbabwe and Mali. So I think that is um, a contribution. Um, would you like to say anything further about that, um, Dr. Ashinathi? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with that statement. And uh, like I said earlier, particularly uh, when uh, referring to what is happening in Nigeria, uh, the infra credit uh, made a very impor important intervention by providing uh, credit guarantee to uh, infrastructure linked uh, uh, securities. Uh, if you seek guarantee from uh, international finance uh, institutions, they will definitely shy away uh, because they think uh, some African countries have uh, too much uh, country risk due to uh, political risk. So if you have uh, a local uh, institution providing guarantee, uh, it will, be, it will uh, definitely solve uh, the problem of uh, political risk uh, in Africa. And we need more of uh, similar interventions in uh, various countries across uh, the, uh, the continent. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, somebody says it would appear that countries with lots of money can now buy Africa in sectors. Okay, that was a comment um, somebody, um, somebody made. And lastly, and now this will have to be um, probably the last comment that we can take because of time. It says, Dr. Fanta, I am thinking of doing research about a financing model to enable SMPs to participate in the renewable energy sector. Where could I find data on this? Uh, some of the databases that I know of uh, can provide uh, data on uh, SMP, SME uh, sectors uh, linked to uh, renewable investment in renewable uh, energies. But if the question is about uh, uh, understanding the infrastructural gap linked to specific uh, sectors in Africa, such data can be obtained from uh, African Development Bank. You can see a level of infrastructural development in Africa uh, from the African Infrastructure Development Index. Uh, the institution has been uh, putting together data uh, to develop an index, and you can see uh, the level of uh, development of uh, specific uh, infrastructural uh, sectors across countries in Africa. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, yes, I have one more comment here, which I'll just quickly, I understand that we have a couple of more minutes. So if you still have a question, quickly pop it in now so, and we might be able to take it. it. says, I agree with you, Ella. Also, infrastructure investments can also be risky when there is not adequate assurance of data collection from the end user of the product. So Ms. Dr. Ashnafi, can you quickly talk around um, this issue of data collection? Yeah, uh, data would be necessary for uh, making uh, a rational decision uh, when investing in uh, infrastructural uh, projects. Uh, it's true, there are uh, concerns uh, 
in terms of uh, lack of adequate data to make a uh, rational decision for investment in infrastructural uh, projects uh, in Africa. Uh, and recently there are uh, some uh, efforts that are being made by the African Development Bank uh, and the World Bank, uh, if you are referring to, for instance, uh, public-private partnership related infrastructural investments, the World Bank provides uh, useful data, uh, country-specific data, uh, data classified into uh, various sectors of uh, infrastructure. And I hope with the uh, uh, advent of uh, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, our need for data will gradually be uh, solved. Uh, uh, and there is also uh, uh, recently uh, growth in uh, what you call, uh, yeah, there are uh, various uh, developments in terms of uh, uh, availability of uh, data and those uh, developments will, I think, uh, will help in accessing useful information or based on which uh, investors can make a decision to, uh, I mean, uh, invest in infrastructural uh, projects. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ashnafi. Um, somebody says SMEs in Namibia have participated in the, as the 5MW solar programs and it goes on to say that um, you may okay um, okay I think maybe this is a private message yeah I want to read the chat later okay I want to say um, thank you to every participant for joining us today I understand we have people from Rwanda Namibia Abuja Lagos Ivory Coast Cape Town Stellenbosch and of course, Johannesburg. So we have quite a lot of people from different places that um, were able to join us today. I want to say a big thank you, and I do hope that you found the presentation very um, educative and informative. Dr. Ashnafi, can we have some final closing words from you before we finally wrap up? Thank you, thank you, Shio. Uh, yeah, what I'd like to say uh, is that uh, the pandemic is a big challenge for uh, even for uh, advanced economies and the impact uh, on Africa is going to be uh, significant mm -hmm. uh, but with uh, some innovative uh, mechanisms uh, we can uh, see uh, a quick uh, economic recovery and my belief is that uh, if we invest in infrastructures that will help in uh, the creation of jobs. It will uh, even uh, help us uh, in recovering uh, uh, private sector activities. The private sector is uh, significantly affected by uh, the pandemic and investment in infrastructure can boost uh, private sector activities as well. And obviously commitment by uh, leaders uh, uh, will be uh, very important. Uh, many uh, leaders across the globe have made uh, a clear pronouncement that uh, they need to invest in infrastructure to recover the economy. Recently, the uh, UK Prime Minister Boris uh, Johnson has made it clear that the country must invest in infrastructure. And in South Africa, as part of the economic recovery plan, investment in infrastructure is uh, identified as uh, one of uh, the priorities. So uh, countries in Africa must, uh, I think, uh, follow the same example and make uh, effort to invest in infrastructure, uh, recognizing its uh, uh, usefulness and its value. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ash Ashnafi. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. So in the absence of any further questions, um, any further comments? Okay, first and foremost, Christelle, I think this, this issue is addressed to you. Um, people have asked on how they are going to get the recording of this presentation. Um, uh, so I guess that that information 
would be passed across and uh, the Christelle would handle that. Just one last thing, because I think we have a couple of minutes, so I'll squeeze it in. It's the, it says regarding the health financing, only 1% of global spending on health is incurred in Africa. Well, that's, um, that's really small, if only 1%. Um, of global spending on health is incurred in Africa, which means that Africa as a whole is not really spending enough on the, on, on the health sector. And that is really, really sad when we look at the mortality rates in Africa. But we do hope that we are going to see a brighter and a, you know, a better tomorrow. I believe that all of us gathered here today have a plan to at least put in our own quarters and do our best to make Africa the continent that it should be. And so I want to say a very thank you once again to everyone, people that have called in from different parts of Africa. We are so glad that you could join us. This is the University of Silent Bosch Business School alumni webinar. And immediately after now, there will be a very detailed information session. So people that are interested in finding out, knowing more information about how our programs run, what programs are available, and what, the, what you might need to do to participate or to log on to any of those programs, please feel free to stay on for the information session. It's going to be here in this same meeting room. So you don't need to log off or log on to anything else. And finally, just let me quickly chip it in. There is going to be another session like this next week, Friday on the 28th, which is going to be hosted by our friends in Ghana. It's going to be a speaker session and an information session just like this. Christelle will tell us what the topic is. Honestly, I can't remember what the topic is. And also on the 21st of August, there will be another session hosted by our friends in Botswana. So that's it from me. My name is Chayo Imologome. I want to say a very big thank you for, to everyone for joining us. And I'm handing over now to Christelle. Thank you very much, Chayo. Um, Wow, thank you so much to both Dr. Ashanafi Fanta and Shayu Imologome, our West Africa chair lady. What a fantastic information uh, presentation and so much information on this topic. Um, congratulations. The comments in the chat box um, really reiterates the value that was added this morning. Lots of thank yous to both of you. Um, for a very professional handling of this um, webinar. We are very proud of our West Africa chapter for always contributing whenever we ask them um, to these events. Thank you, Shayo and Ashanafi. Thank you, Dr. Fanta and Shayo. It was very informative. <clears throat> Sorry, some of the comments that we read here from the chat box. Um, as Shaya was just mentioned, this is the first of three part series of our Africa webinars. And the next one um, is next Friday, same time. And it is titled, What Can Africa Contribute to the Fourth Industrial Revolution? That is hosted by our Ghana chapter and will be presented by Professor Martin Butler. And then we also have one on the 3rd of September, if I can just get to that one. And that will be presented by Professor Mishak Asiakpono and hosted by our East Africa chapter. And the title of that one is The Challenges and Options of Economic Development Financing in Africa During and After COVID-19. So you can see we have a series of very interesting topics, one flowing into the other. And of course, all three of these webinars are followed by the detailed USB program information sessions by our key USB faculty, who will be sharing it. And immediately during these information sessions, a broad overview will be presented of the USB program information. And then that will be followed by open days, uh, two weeks, one week starting 7 October and one week starting early, uh, one week starting 7 September and one week starting early October. 
but more of that will be explained a bit later. If I may share with you um, the pro, the information contact details while we wait for our new participants to enter the room, um, I will share with you program information contact details. screen the contact details there for Charmaine Garcia and of course if you reside in West East Africa Mauritius our agent is Dr. Mariki van der Marwe who is also the host of the next session and then for our USB executives development the contact details are right at the bottom. You can take a leg stretch um, until we wait for our next group of guests to enter the room before we start with the program information session. Thank you again, Shayo, Dr. Fanta, and we say goodbye for you to you for now, and we look forward to a next opportunity with you. Thank you to all our guests from all over Africa. Shayo mentioned where, where they're all from. Thank you for um, sharing this opportunity with us this morning. We really value your participation and without you, <clears throat> nothing of this is possible. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Christian. We will just take a small leg stretch. We give two or three minutes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, all the, in, the links to the upcoming two Friday um, webinar events are also posted in the chat box. Um, so you're happy to copy from there or to find your links there and to register for next Friday. And remember, once you attend the alumni webinar on this platform, you can automatically stay on for the program information session. Um, that will follow immediately hereafter.